Good morning and welcome to the fourth meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should ensure they're turned to silent. Uh, we've received apologies today from Jackson Carlaw, MSP, and I'd like to welcome John Scott, MSP, to the meeting. Our first item of business today is a decision to take agenda items three and four in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Our second item today is an evidence session with Creative Scotland on sustainable funding for the arts and creative organisations in Scotland. And I'd like to welcome the witnesses, Janet Archer, Chief Executive Officer of Creative Scotland, and Ben Thompson, the Interim Chair of Creative Scotland. Um, Janet Archer has indicated she wishes to make a, an opening statement. Is that correct? Uh, can I ask you to be as brief as possible? Um, because I know that many members have questions they would like to ask you. Of course. Thank you, yeah. convener. And um, good morning, everyone. And thank you to the committee for inviting us to give evidence this morning. We're here to talk about sustainable funding for the arts and creative organisations in Scotland. Creative Scotland's most significant means by which we provide this is via three-year regular funding. Our first round spanned 15 to 18, and our guidance for the second round, 2018 to 21, was published in November 2016. The process and guidance for regular funding was tested with sector representatives who worked with us to review the guidance prior to us going live. I want to start by saying I'm profoundly sorry that the delivery of this process has been a negative one for many, and we can't let this happen again. My role as, creative, as Chief Executive of Creative Scotland is to take ultimate responsibility for everything that Creative Scotland does. And I'm currently in dialogue with everyone involved at every level in the process, and I'll make sure that we learn from this moment and resolve all the outstanding issues fairly and openly. I'd like to offer some context, which I hope the committee will find helpful. Regular funding is an open application process. This time we had 184 applications applications and we've funded 121. Overall, we've committed to spending 33.9 million on regular funding, 1 million more a year than previously. And that was due to a 6.6 .6 million uplift from the Scottish Government, for which we are very grateful. Regular funding is no longer reliant on the National Lottery, as it previously was. We previously put 6 million of National Lottery funding into regularly funded organisations. So many of you will be aware that between September and December last year, we were scenario planning some very difficult budget predictions. In the end, the budget prediction was better than we expected, but it's important, however, to recognise that the 21% uplift that we communicated is made up of £10 million per screen, which is set against hard economic targets, and £6.6 .6 million to replace the lost lottery income for the arts, as I've already outlined. And that means that our regularly funded budget effectively remains at standstill. <coughs> Despite this, we've been able to support 121 excellent organisations across Scotland, across art forms for the next three years. Um, at one point last autumn, we thought we might only have been able to fund about half of those. The, the new organisations in the network haven't had a lot of press, so I'm just going to just tell you a little bit about those. It includes 19 organisations who are new, such as Alchemy Film Festival in Hoyk, Body Serve Scotland in Murray, Starcatchers, Scotland's National Arts and Early Years Organisation, Lyra, based in Craig Miller in Edinburgh, Toonspeak, which provides free high-quality drama and theatre activities for young people aged 11 to 25 in Glasgow, Theatre Gouliot, the acclaimed Gaelic theatre company, and the Tinderbox Collective, uh, based at the North Edinburgh Arts. Making funding decisions is never easy, nowhere more so than in Scotland, where... I think creative talent and ambition far outweighs the funding that we have available, particularly in the context of increased reliance on Creative Scotland, as alternative support, sources of support come under increasing pressure. And I fully understand that even those who've received standstill funding, even those organisations are really struggling. And as, but as stated in our art strategy, we're committed to working with all organisations to support them to build resilience in the future. Overall, the applications we received total 33% more than our available budget, and that created a real challenge for us, particularly when organisations asked for an average of a 23% uplift. 
We've tried to help by supporting all organisations coming out of regular funding through providing transition funding of between six and 12 months at the same level that they're currently funded at. We're also in the process of meeting organisations to explain our decisions and where they've been unsuccessful, discuss alternative routes to funding and how we might be able to support them in the future. Regular funding is one of our three routes to funding, sitting alongside open project and targeted funding, which includes SCREEN. And over the coming three years, we expect to distribute about 83 million of government and national lottery funds a year across these three funding routes. One immediate thing that I want to tackle, which is really important to me, is to make project funding more straightforward for artists and artist-led organisations. I completely appreciate and recognise that the regularly funded process has been more challenging this time round than it needed to be, for both for those applying and for our staff. And it's clear that the introduction of the Turing Fund, which based, was based on a review of Turing, which included consultation, didn't chime with everyone in the theatre sector and is not seen as a replacement for regular funding. And that's one of the reasons why the board elected to take stock increase the budget available for regular funding and add organisations to the network. We understand that this final stage of the process has created real difficulties. None of us want to relive that experience in, as it's in three years' time. And that's why, as we've already announced, we're committed, we've committed to a, re, a written branch review of how we fund. We'll importantly do this in collaboration with the people and organisations that we fund. So we welcome all the constructive communications that we've received, of which there's been a significant amount and much dialogue ha as has emerged. We're meeting with sector representative bodies such as the Scottish Contemporary Art Network, Federation of Scottish Theatre, Literature Alliance Scotland, and others whom we already work closely with in the coming weeks to help shape how we approach this review. And finally, I want to thank the dedicated, hardworking, and knowledgeable staff at Creative Scotland who work every day to make a positive difference to art and culture in our country. Many have joined us recently after, or over, the, over, over years of high-profile careers in the sector. Others have built up immense knowledge over many years of service. They've all worked thoughtfully and diligently on this regular funding round, dedicating a great deal of time, energy and care to the process. We are all committed to doing things differently in the future. Many ideas have surfaced as we've been working through our difficult decisions and we're looking forward to sharing those as we enter into dialogue over the coming months. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm sure um, the sector out there um, is hearing uh, your apology uh, for what went wrong, but you did design the system. Uh, and when the RFO funding was announced on the 25th of January, uh, you, um, Janet Archer, said that uh, the decisions had been arrived at through a careful and thorough decision-making process. And Ben Thompson, uh, you repeated that as well. You said the decisions had arrived at through a clear and careful process. Uh, but that wasn't true, was it? Um, first, th thank you, Jane. If I can say just uh, uh, one correction in your opening statement. I'm not the interim chair of Creative Scotland. Um, that uh, I stopped being the interim chair last week. Um, I'm here because I was the interim chair over the period that this, this happened. Uh, Robert Wilson is now the chair of Creative Scotland. Um, I took the job on after Richard Finlay had died for six months. So um, if you just have the minutes as being um, previous interim chair. That's fair. Um, pro, the pro, back to the process. Um, so the process that we delivered this time round was the same process that we delivered last time round. Um, it involved an initial stage, which was to check applications for compliance. Uh, we then assessed applications based on our guidance, uh, and then we took the, each application into a, a, a balancing process, first through the lens of individual art forms and specialisms, and then through a broader pool of thinking. In our guidance, we were very clear that we would assess based against our 10-year plan, our strategies, and our sector reviews. Uh, and what that did eventually was to generate a set of recommendations that went up to the board for consideration. Um, we tested the process with a, a small group of sector representatives before we published in November um, 2016. Um, the difference this time round to last time round was 
we plan the process to be able to make announcements in October, um, by October, which was the, the, the period, the time frame that we announced announcements um, after the um, 15 to 18 round, um, in the event, because of the late um, budget announcement, which we, we know was, was due to a, a, a waiting for a UK bu budget announcement, we couldn't announce um, until January because our, our, we received our budget in, in, in December. Um, and so that's the difference in terms of time frame. I asked, you, I asked you why you said at the time that it had been a clear and careful uh, process when now you're saying it wasn't, that uh, from, it went wrong. From the board's perspective, um, the, um, uh, since I joined in August, every board meeting has discussed the RFO process. The um, scenarios at each board were discussed up until um, uh, even the December board, there were four scenarios being discussed at each meeting because we were unable, our last board meeting was on the 14th of December before the budget was announced. So we didn't have any ideas whether or not we were going to have a 10% cut or a 20% increase. And we had to scenario plan all of those. But that included it looking at all the decision-making um, processes and two of our board members uh, um, Karen Forbes and Aaron Foster sat in on the process to ensure that cor good corporate governance was was being done. So uh, um, the process, certainly from the board's perspective, was very rigorous. The team was very rigorous. We had brought in outside consultants um, to look at each of the sectors. Um, uh, we looked at it both on a sector basis and on an overall portfolio basis. Um, and, uh, um, and then when it came to January, where we were in a position to know what the budget was, and I'm very pleased to say that at that stage the lottery deficit had been addressed, we had an hour's uh, presentation on looking at each of the art forms and the strategies behind them and why um, uh, uh, decisions had been made in each of those art forms. And we looked at the whole portfolio of, uh, of uh, in, in aggregate to look at how that looked in terms of shape, geographic, diversity, EDI, youth, etc. And, and then the board had a, uh, uh, a quite rigorous debate challenging the um, executive on the decisions and the strategies that they made over the next two hours. And at the end of that process, um, all of the, at that stage, 116 companies that had been organizations that had been recommended to the board were approved for funding going forward. I have spoken to someone who was at that board meeting on the 18th of January. Uh, you said at the time that the decision was unanimous, but it wasn't unanimous because the issues that have then uh, hit the, the public realm about, uh, uh, for example, the equalities agenda and the fact that you've taken money away from uh, world-class theatre companies in the disabled sector, um, that was raised. The issue of the, the fact that you were cutting children's theatre in the Year of Young People was raised by your board members. Um, and you, so there's really no excuses, but you, you went ahead anyway. I think, I think in any process like this, there are going to be reservations. Everyone around the board had um, reservations about certain things. Um, uh, there were two particular organisations that had been uh, significant organisations that had been added from the December board meeting, which um, uh, um, uh, certain board members felt um, shouldn't be part of RFO, should be handled in a special way, and that we then took a further 48 hours to consider those, and they were added to the RFO. But everyone agreed that the 116 list was to be funded. I would say that um, virtually every board member had raised concerns, which is absolutely the natural process of wanting to take a difficult decision like this. And we had looked at areas like youth and EDI and geographical uh, diversity and the balance between networking organisations and direct organisations and had a very robust discussion about it. You said you looked at geographical diversity. In 2014, you covered 21 local authority areas. You still cover 21 local authority areas. You haven't actually improved your geographical diversity. Can I take that? But just for clarification on the unanimous word, um, since Ben stepped down, our new chair chaired his first meeting um, 
very recently, um, and the board considered the word unanimous, uh, the use of the word unanimous. The, minute, the meeting that took the RFO decisions um, took place in, uh, uh, in January. Um, the, the board reflected on the minute and amended it to say majority decision, um, and that, um, that was um, uh, put in place um, after the meeting. Um, but as, as, as Ben has said, uh, overall, the board made the decisions and signed off the recommendations that the executive made in January. Yeah, but that's quite a, that's quite a big mistake to say something's unanimous when you actually had a huge Barney at the meeting uh, and the members of your own board flagged up exactly the kind of problems that's the reason why you're here before us today. Um, the other thing is that I've been told <coughs> that uh, it's highly unusual for board members to get papers uh, and then those papers are changed at the last minute, just before the 18th of January meeting, to change the funding decisions uh, that had previously been made? There were um, uh, uh, two uh, relatively small changes made between the 12th of December, when the papers were due to be sent out and were sent out, uh, sorry, 12th of January, when the papers were due to be sent out, and the 18th of January. Um, they were discussed um, at the board and, uh, um, uh, and I don't think it's unusual in a time when, um, uh, um, uh, in a time when a lot of, um, uh, you know, we only knew the budget um, after the 14th of December, at a time when considerations were going on, that there would be a couple of small changes in the board. And through, you know, a, a long process, the deadline for these applications w was April, and the fact is that you did get your extra money uh, from the government. Uh, how many organisations were, uh, were tagged as fundable by your specialist teams and those decisions were then overturned by management. How, ma how many times did that happen? I can get the exact data for you on that point um, because we were scenario planning um, against a number of different scenarios. So um, just to be really clear, from October, we were scenario planning against standstill um, the potential for an uplift minus 15% and minus 30%. So each of those scenarios had different groupings of organisations. We, we, we know, for example, at Firex, I have said um, that you know that the specialists recommended them for funding, and it was an executive management decision that overturned that. So, and there were lots like that. I mean, we have had a, probably an unprecedented amount of communication. Uh, from the sector in a short period of time uh, and there are many examples of people who your specialists who you've praised recommended for funding and your executive team overturned that. So overall 156 applications could have been funded to £123 million. Our budget was obviously not £123 million. So our process as published took into account assessment and judgment and we knew that we would never be in a position, as we are with all of our funds, in open project funding, we're currently funding 30% of the applications that we get. We get many applications which are fundable, which aren't, we're not able to fund, and consequently we have to make decisions based on our strategies. Mm -hmm. I'll just pass on uh, to Claire Baker shortly, but I just wanted to go back to this issue. You've continually said that your process was, uh, was very careful. Uh, I was speaking yesterday to... Um, uh, Frank McConnell um, from uh, the choreographer for uh, Plan B, the dance company in the Highlands, uh, which didn't uh, get its lost its RFO funding. And you've put in place transition funds for companies that have lost their funding. And he said to me uh, they were offered £108,000 of transition funding. He says some companies have been offered 12 months, uh, but no reason was given for uh, the fact that they got six months funding of £108,000. He went for the meeting uh, at Creative Scotland on the 16th of February, the debrief meeting with Claire Byers, your Head of Arts and Engagement. Um, and she asked Plan B to submit a half sheet of A4 paper on how they would spend that £108,000 of transition funding. Uh, and she, she then, according to Frank McConnell, said, you can spend it on anything you wish, save taking a holiday in the Bahamas. She said, she added that she alone just needed to sign it off and send it to the auditors. It took Plan B the best part of five months to work up its artistic ideas and application form for somebody to turn round and say, you can just have a half uh, A4 paper 
um, that I can just give to the auditors and you can spend it how you like. It's A, it's patronising to them, and it seems to me to kind of like absolutely blow a hole through your your um, assertions that you have a very careful process and you're careful with the way you spend public money. Obviously, convener, it's the first time I've heard that account of that meeting, and I will go back to Claire Byers and, uh, and, and, and ask for her feedback. I will also go back to Frank McConnell, who I've known for m many decades, uh, and ask him to talk to me directly about that meeting. Yeah. Well, he also said it's very difficult to talk to anyone directly at Creative Scotland, but I'll pass on now to Claire Baker. Um, Tron, on the, um, on, the, uh, 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 on the additional funding amounts, um, uh, and at the meetings that I attended with sectors, um, it, it was explained, and I'm sorry if it wasn't explained well enough, the reason for extending it out on transition funding was because we had said the decisions were going to be made by the end of November, and because of the fact that we didn't, weren't in a position until the middle of December to know on the budget, that had to be pushed out until the end of January. So we gave the extra funding so that people had a full six months from the end of January um, uh, uh, of financial support, and they wouldn't be in a position of having too short a period to be able to readjust strategies if they weren't going to get funding going forward. And that was communicated to, um, uh, to the sectors. Yeah. And do, can I just be clear that the board exercise in um, returning to the budget took into account the fact that we'd included sector development organisations in the initial set of recommendations. We hadn't moved the budget over at that point um, because that's what we'd said we'd always, we'd always base the budget on the same figure that we used for 1518. Uh, in the event, what the board elected to do was to extend the budget to account for an extra million a year to accommodate the spend that we were spending on sector development organisations in order to allow some additional uh, arts uh, producing and touring companies back into back into play. Well, that's obviously a huge criticism that you've moved money away from uh, artists uh, to development organisations. I think 4.7 million you've moved away to development organisations. So that's funding bureaucrats instead of artists. But I'm keen to move on to Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, I'm sure it's been noted this morning that Janet Archer has give a, given a profound apology for the recent events that we've had. And I also noted when you talked about the new organisations, which I think you said were 90 new organisations, does include um, organisations working with early years, perhaps organisations working in areas that don't receive regular funding in the same way that has been we've been used to. So I do take those points on board, but I think there are issues here that need to be scrutinised if we're going to look at how um, Creative Scotland distributes funding into the future and what has gone wrong in the recent set of circumstances. Um, and in addition to the convener's questions about this year's RFO announcement, when the, we have all as MSPs received a number of representations, particularly from theatres working with young people and providing um, artists for young people and also from the disability community. On the 6th of February, a decision was taken by the board to reverse some of the funding cuts. Um, can you explain on what basis the decision was made that some organisations had their funding reinstated, while other organisations who have received representation for um, didn't have their funding um, reinstated? You have been at pains to stress that this was a detailed um, and thoughtful process to reach the original conclusion, and yet within two weeks there seems to have been a turnaround for some organisations but not for others. Yes, so the board looked at all of the organisations which had been assessed as being fundable but hadn't been funded uh, and had a, 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 an account of all of those organisations in terms of their assessments um, and some narrative in relation to how um, the recommendations um, had been um, finalised uh, and the board took its decisions in the context of, 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 of all of the organisations that had been assessed as fundable but not not funded. Uh, some advice um, was um, provided in relation to the organisations that had assessed strongest out of that. Obviously, we couldn't fund all of those organisations, uh, and the board um, discussed and debated that, that advice um, and also other organisations um, on, on the list. So we, we spent um, some time, I can't remember how much, but the, the extent of the board meeting uh, where the board asked questions about um, organisations on that list. And we had um, 
a significant number of, of, of our leadership team in the room, uh, our Director of Arts, Director of Strategy, Deputy Chief Executive, Director of Finance, Director of Communications, um, and the project manager that, 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 that oversaw RFO um, in order to be able to uh, ensure that we had the right information available to the board in making those decisions. Well, I think from the representation from the sector and among MSPs, um, nobody disagrees with the decision to reinstate the funding for those organisations. But we have had um, representation to suggest it's those that are the most organised, that can be most vocal, that can, um, that can have the most profile around their cuts, who have managed to have their funding reinstated, while other organisations haven't, even though um, they can show that they are uh, providing a good, qu good quality and high level work. That they, they are still not to receive any funding. So, so just to be clear, the board looked at the highest scoring, um, highest assessed um, organisations, um, and three of the organisations that were selected um, for funding were in that category. Uh, the board then looked at its commitment to qualities in the context of the equalities impact assessment that we had produced by that point. Um, and the board also looked at our guidance from the Cabinet Secretary in, in relation to the additional £6.6 .6 million, pounds, which um, I think is, is, is illustrated in your committee papers, uh, asks us to think about children and young people. Um, it is astonishing that those weren't taken into consideration prior to the decision being made, the equality impact assessment, or the fact that it's a year of the young people or the government's policies around equality within the arts. It just seems surprising that those weren't, that wasn't yeah. obvious o before the decision was made the first time around. And overall, we do have a considerable amount of provision for children and young people across the network. Um, what the board wanted to do was to add to that. At the meeting on the um, 18th of Jan uh, January, um, so that was the one before the one on the 2nd of, of February, um, the board had looked at the 116 recommendations and um, uh, there was a particular, there, there, was an, there was a very strong debate about the relative measures of, of, of uh, networked organisations versus direct organisations. Perhaps we can come back to that. Um, there was also uh, a, a lot of discussion about the touring fund and how that worked. And remember that RFO is only one mechanism that we fund um, uh, going forward. We had taken into consideration the, um, the reports on touring and the, the, the difficulties in touring. Um, there's a 55-page report that, um, that we did uh, in conjunction with FST um, on looking at um, touring and how to make that better. And, um, uh, um, and um, in looking at that, uh, we were swayed by the fact that the new provisions for touring um, did mean that um, we thought better ways of funding those touring companies that weren't in the portfolio. And that was a, a, a debate, a significant debate that we had. In the light of subsequent discussions, we recognised that actually um, uh, um, RFO as a status is important to organisations. We listened to that feedback. And when we came back um, on the second, we said, how much more of the budget could we take that would actually add to the RFO? And uh, in a dealing with uh, head of audit, um, we could take two million out of things that we wanted to do in, in more strategic ways. We weren't reducing any funding going forward. It was just an uplift in funding that we were taking from strategic things. There was an additional two million um, um, that we could put back into RFOs. Um, so the first debate was, could we take, given the importance of the RFO statement uh, that we were getting feedback on, any more and put it into RFOs? Um, we were also saving a bit, which took the total level up to 2.6 from reducing the transition funding, because those organisations that came back in wouldn't then have to have transition funding because they were part of regularly or, um, funded organisations. Once we'd set that level of um, additional amount that went into RFO, then we looked at all 42 uh, uh, organisations, took the feedback from um, the executives about uh, um, which of those should be prioritised, particularly in light of the discussions that we'd had on EDI and youth, and came up with the additional five organisations that should um, be added to the list to take it to 121. 
a, a final point. Um, Organisations have also described the application process as opaque and um, they, they don't understand uh, why funding has been cut. They can't anticipate that funding is likely to be reduced. Or um, How do you respond to those criticisms of the process? And I really understand the uh, and sympathise totally with organisations because funding, you know, funding of this sort is really important and it's very hard to take, take uh, um, uh, um, uh, the decisions knowing that you know, you're trying to get what will work best for um, uh, um, uh, uh, culture in Scotland going forward. So, um, uh, um, but we're trying to work with organisations, not just with RFOs, but with the other pots of funding that we have to help those art forms um, develop in other ways. So each of the organisations that um, we couldn't fund through RFO have been talked to um, and discussed how they can access other forms of funding to take their business plans forward. Thank you. Ross Green. You know, <clears throat> just like to drill down on the process around this emergency board meeting. So, um, Janet, you've outlined who was in the room, but a number of the organisations who were being discussed with the subject of that emergency board meeting have indicated that they were not aware of that fact. Could you confirm to us where the organisations whose funding applications were being discussed again at that meeting informed in advance of the meeting that their application, their previously unsuccessful application, would be back on the agenda? No. We didn't do that um, because the meeting was called with very short notice um, in the context of a week where much happened and we didn't know whether or not the board at that point was going to be a, of a mind to extend the budget uh, in order to be able to accommodate um, any more organisations and it felt inappropriate to raise hopes if they weren't going to be able to be met. A number of these organisations had uh, raised concerns with you um, either towards the end of the process or immediately after receiving news that their application was unsuccessful, concerns that uh, reports that had been compiled on their applications it included factual inaccuracies by the time they had reached your board. A number of these organisations requested urgent meetings with you. Why did you not feel that it was important to meet with those organisations and receive clarification on whether or not there had indeed been inaccuracies, factual inaccuracies, rather than um, disagreements over judgment, ahead of a meeting where you would be discussing whether or not to fund them. Surely errors in the process, factual inaccuracies, would have made a material difference to whether or not they were going to receive funding through the emergency meeting. We had already set up meetings with all of the organisations um, that um, we were in the process post the first uh, set of announcements of 116 organisations to meet organisations, both uh, who'd been funded and, and who hadn't been funded. The, the, we're in the middle of that process now, so we're, we're, we're uh, you know, I would say we're not even halfway through meeting all of the organisations um, that we need to in order to um, look at um, what, feeding back and look at options in relation to, to future options for funding. The, We've had some complaints in relation to the accuracy of the process and we'll obviously treat those uh, in accordance with our policy. Um, and at this stage, we've not concluded that process. Do you why an organisation might have lost all confidence in Creative Scotland if they believed there had been a factual inaccuracy in the report on their application, they had been unsuccessful in receiving funding, they then heard after the fact that their application had been considered again at an emergency board meeting, the issue of the factual errors they had raised had not been addressed and they had again been unsuccessful. I can, and as I say, we're in the middle of that process of looking at all of the organisations' assessments with applicants, uh, and once we've completed that process, I'll be in a position to give you a better sense of the uh, extent to which that's an issue. Thank you. It's also worth saying that the board did not meet to look at factual inaccuracies. They met because um, of uh, an understanding that people do attach real significance to RFO, and we were able to uh, increase the budget over the three years by about 1% of our total budget um, would to, to reallocate to, um, to that. So the decision was actually, in, in order to increase the envelope on RFO, could we get a little bit more to then award to those organisations that are already 
in a, with the same process, but actually extend it by an extra, in the end, five organisations. Whether or not the board met to discuss factual inaccuracies is really what we're discussing here. The board met to discuss whether or not organisations who'd been unsuccessful were going to receive funding. If there had been factual inaccuracies in the process, it is, of course, entirely possible that they were materially relevant to the decision that was eventually made. So the factual inaccuracies are absolutely relevant to the discussion that the board had. Whether or not they were the reason that the board had it is not relevant. Well, the board was unaware of any factual inaccuracies. Well, a, a number of these organisations had raised those concerns, so that seems to be an internal communication issue for your organisation, mm -hmm. that these organisations raised concerns, a range of other concerns, but concerns about factual inaccuracies here. If the board were unaware that those concerns had been raised before you then made decisions about funding, that again is a serious material consideration, that the board was unaware that the reports that you'd received were potentially inaccurate. So who, who in Creative Scotland was aware that concerns had been raised over factual inaccuracies. If the board wasn't aware, where did the awareness stop? Because these organisations clearly wanted the board to be aware. The, the, we're meeting organisations through, we've got many applicants, um, and we're deploying uh, all of our lead officers and um, directors into meetings with organisations. As I say, we're midway through that process at the moment, so I can't account for the full extent to which there may be factual inaccuracies. Um, we haven't yet taken stock uh, of the outcomes of those meetings. We've got a, um, a log um, which is being populated at the moment, uh, and once that log has been completed, I'll be able to report to you. Convener, just one more point on this. It, Janet Archer, why was the board not informed that if, if you had received concerns about factual inaccuracies, the board was then to make a decision based on the same information that they had previously, why was the board not informed that there were potentially factual inaccuracies in the paperwork that they were going to make a decision based on? Of the second set of decisions, I was unaware of the fact that there were factual inaccuracies in any of the assessments. Uh, I still don't fully understand the extent to which there may be factual Scotland was aware. There's an internal communication breakdown here. These concerns were raised with the organisation ahead of the emergency board meeting, but the board were not informed of that. Some, that's, that's a serious internal communication breakdown. I'm just trying to make sense of this, and you'll understand that I'm, I'm in, in the, we're in the middle of a process at the moment which is not completed. Um, so we had, a, a, we had an extensive amount of correspondence um, following the announcement of the first um, set of uh, decisions, uh, and we, that, that correspondence um, constituted a, a range of um, campaigning for individual companies um, as well as um, thoughtful contributions in relation to whether or not regular funding is the right way to deploy funding, uh, as well as individual concerns raised by individual individual organisations. Um, we, we, all of that um, needs to be collated with the process that we're going through now to sit down and discuss with individual applicants what their concerns are and to check whether indeed there are factual inaccuracies or not. Uh, when that process is concluded, uh, I will be in a position to be able to give you a more fulsome answer to your question. Scott in here now because I know that he's got some issues, I, I believe, relating to those factual inaccuracies. Indeed, I have, uh, Convener, and uh, thank you very much for allowing me to attend your committee this morning. I can also thank Jan Archer for appearing before the committee today and also for her apology, and also pay tribute to Richard Finlay for his lifelong contribution to the arts in Scotland. And can I also pay tribute while I'm at it to almost 300 volunteers uh, at the Gaiety in Air and Jeremy Wyatt and Ian Welsh, who now run the Gaiety, uh, as well as South Ayrshire Council and also the Scottish Government through Alec Neil all of whom have combined to refurbish and resurrect the gaiety in recent years. I'm also saying this to let Janet Archer know how much effort has gone into this iconic community venture. 
and went into borderline in the past, as <coughs> Janet and I discussed um, a week or so ago, and previously destroyed by the previous Arts Council when its funding was withdrawn because it was then regarded as being too successful. So I would also like her to invite her to note that RFO funding is vital to the future of the Gaiety and would firstly like to ask if even at this late stage in the process, what funding can still be directed towards the Gaiety, given that the Gaiety application was misunderstood by Creative Scotland, as I understand it, in terms of funding available to it. Happy to go into more detail in that regard, but be interested in your initial response, please. Obviously, the Air Gaiety Theatre is one of the RFOs which hasn't been funded. Um, we funded the organisation for a long time, including through capital. Um, we are in discussion, and I think we've had an initial meeting and we'll have continued to have meetings both with the, with the theatre and with the local authority to look at options in relation to alternative routes to funding in the future. Where, and as you know, because we've had a conversation directly, uh, I'm very aware that Air, Ayrshire, South Ayrshire is, I think, about 7% of the population. Um, it's lean on provision overall. Uh, it's really important that we work with the local, sorry, with South Ayrshire Council um, and with others to stimulate um, stronger applications in, in, in the future, and we're very committed to doing that. We do fund a number of things in, 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 in Ayrshire, so um, we do have a place partnership with South Ayrshire where we've invested £200,000, which is matched um, by, by, by local investment. Um, we fund um, Scottish Youth Dance. Um, we gave them £700 to work with young people in North Ayrshire, um, and um, we have funded um, other smaller initiatives in, in Pennyburn um, and the zone initiative um, in, 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 in the area. So um, there are a number of things underway. We are considering very seriously how to extend out beyond the 21 local authorities that we're investing in, just um, so that you're aware of the 12 remaining local authorities. Um, eight didn't actually put any applications in, so um, obviously we're not able to fund through RFO when people don't apply to us. Um, but we know we can. It, it, it's, it's clear that there's, there's an anchor point which is historic in Edinburgh and Glasgow. We, as you say, we faced the same issues last time round. I think we have to have an open, honest conversation with our sectors and with the public in relation to whether that's the right thing for Scotland and we're completely open to having that discussion um, as part of the process of reviewing how we to distribute funding in the future. In terms of ac accuracy, if my memory serves me correctly in a conversation I had, I believe that a figure that Creative Scotland thought was available to the Air Gaiety was understood from their application to be 1.7 million that figure was in fact misread, as I understand it, by Creative Scotland, when in fact the funding available to them was only £1.1 million. Pounds. I'm not certain of the source. But that is a difference of some £600,000, which was misunderstood, as I understand it, by Creative Scotland in assessing the Air Gaiety's mm -hmm. application. £600,000 is a huge amount of money, if I've got the figures correct. And I stand to be challenged on that, but that's certainly my recollection of the conversation. So that is the first point. The second point is that, I mean, do you realise that the decision made to withdraw funding from rural Scotland essentially, essentially anywhere south of Glasgow and Edinburgh, and concentrate the funding, as it appears, around Glasgow and Edinburgh, notwithstanding the small amounts of funding that is available in the Asher that you've talked about, but to concentrate the funding in the central belt appears elitist, and dismissive, to be frank, of Ayrshire and the Scottish borders. And I just wonder how you're going to address that in future, and indeed, not necessarily in future, in the immediate, because this has an immediate and real effect on our iconic community asset in, in Ayrshire. Well, obviously, the decisions that we've made have been based on the strengths of applications, um, and I wouldn't want to comment on individual applications in any respect. We are in discussion with South Ayrshire Council um, and have a meeting set to have a discussion with, 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 with the Council and with the theatre. Uh, we've already met 
um, the theatre to, 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 to discuss initial options in terms of future, future funding. The report I've had is that that initial meeting was positive in terms of looking at options uh, for alternative routes to funding for, for, for the venue in, in, in the future. Um, we need to take this step by step, um, but I think you're right. It's really important that we service the people of Scotland. Um, clearly, there's a, there's, a, there's a challenge in terms of historic commitments to funding organisations uh, which have emerged from the central belt. Um, and I think we need to have an open discussion in relation to how we tackle that, uh, involving everybody who benefits from, from, from funding uh, for everywhere. Actually, to let other members get in, Tavish Scott. I wonder if I can go back to Ross Gray's uh, questioning about the, the, these two board meetings, and, and please correct me if I get the dates wrong. But the board, the, your, your board met on the the 18th of January um, to discuss the or to make decisions about the regular fund model, correct? And then, when did the board meet in February? Second of February. So between the 18th and the second, what happened to to to, to make you change the board change its view on five organisations? So um, the, we, the, there were 116 recommended organisations on the 18th, and we, as I said, had a robust dis discussion about, um, uh, um, in particular, we, we looked at all the art forms and the strategies within them and how they fitted. We looked at geographical, EDI, youth, network versus direct, um, and, and we also had a very robust discussion about touring. And I think that um, if there's any point that we got wrong on this, um, and, I, and I hold my hand up in that, um, you know, having not been long in the job, I would have probably been better served had I um, understood this more, is that we are under the apprehension that the touring um, programme, the sector was more behind the strategy of doing touring through a different mechanism. So we had set up um, a... Um, a funding mechanism to allow touring to be done. Um, the feedback from the sector, as evidenced by the report I mentioned earlier, which had been in conjunction with the FST, showed that there were real concerns about touring not being done particularly well in Scotland. We wanted to address that and whether RFO was the right mechanism to do that. Five companies weren't given funding in the RFO? Not all the five are, are touring yeah, companies, indeed. but four out of the five are. But the touring fund doesn't exist yet, does it? Well, the touring fund has been announced, and the amount for it doesn't the actually exist at this, as we speak. It doesn't, but the allocation for the touring fund has been made for the for the next year. Yes. For which financial year? For um, two thousand and uh, um, from April April next April, April nineteen. So, so Sorry, we're in eighteen. And the, co the the commitment to the companies that are impacted uh, by that is. 12 months in order to create a bridge between now okay, and but that that's, point. Okay, but in so, fairness, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking why, so, why did you make a decision um, on the, in your second emergency board meeting a matter of days after the previous board meeting to reinstate those five organisations? Because the, um, the feedback that we got, and it's important who, to listen to... Who was the feedback from? Well, from organisation... At that stage, all the... Organ, uh, had gone out. We had feedback from organisations, bodies... Um, uh, such as FST, who are saying particularly um, our organisations do not see the strategic fund as being an alternative. They see RFO as being a very important status and we would like as much as we possibly can to go through RFO. And in, that, in the light of that, the board said, can we do any more? And first question was, can we do... We, we met in the light of the feedback and there was a fairly a large amount of... If, this is, if there's more feedback, would you have another meeting? It does call into it's clear because question it calls into, it, 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 you don't get the point that it calls into question your whole procedures. You know, if, if people kick up as they inevitably will when they don't get funding, it's quite understandable. You said that yourselves. You then have an emergency board meeting. You reinstate five. So the logic of that is that people should kick up even more. You'll have another emergency board meeting and put more back in. And the board discussed that and said, look, we could have just been intransigent and said we're sticking at 116. Mm. So we're exactly. not listening to anyone. And then the criticism would have been. People don't listen to feedback when it's, it's, it's coming to them. So actually, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a debate. And we had, we had the option on the table, which was discussed on the second, of yeah. let's do nothing and just leave it at 116 yeah, sure. and trust in the, in the strategy in the going process. forward. And yeah. that was absolutely a valid option to take. Yeah. And these things come down to judgment and balance. It was felt that 
particularly in the light of we thought there was greater support by the sector for, um, for touring. And some of the EDI, um, in the overall portfolio, EDI and youth was, was strong, but some of the decisions on touring, and there is quite a bit of EDI and mm -hmm. youth in that. Because of that um, feedback, the board said, can we stretch the budget anymore without reducing core funding in other areas, taking some of the increases that we want to do and put it back into yeah. RFO? I mean, I, I entirely get all that, Mr. Thompson, and, uh, but don't, and I appreciate you're no longer the chairman and, and you know, in that sense, but don't you see that you seem to me to have set a precedent whereby uh, if organisations are not funded, make enough noise, and presumably they get onto the Cabinet Secretary, they get onto the MSP, they get onto John Scott, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, a huge row is created. You then have an emergency board meeting a few weeks later and change your minds. Look, I'm sorry if um, we, 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 I mean, we, we, we had a balance to make. I'm sorry if we got the balance wrong, because I quite understand that um, uh, um, the, the squeaky wheel getting the grease, as I think someone described it to me as, um, is, uh, is, uh, sets a precedent. On the other hand, I don't think any organisation or body, whether that's government or otherwise, mm. shouldn't listen to feedback coming back and, and assess that and take a balanced judgment. And that's what a board is, is supposed to do. So does that mean more of the, more of the, fo the 40 uh, organisations that didn't get regular uh, funding are still in the game. They still have a chance of getting... No, because we, we stretched the budget to the point at which, you know, it's a, it's a small stretch. Over the three years, you know, we're talking about uh, 250 million. So you're, you're, we're stretching the budget by an extra 2 million, which is sort of 1%. Could we stretch the budget a little bit more to add some organisations, review the organisations that have been put through and who would be the next organisations that we would choose, taking on board the discussions that we had had on the 18th of January. Okay, so uh, the, I forget who asked the earlier question about the scoring, but I think Janet Archer said that there was a scoring mechanism which was presented to the board in terms of these, uh, of the 40 that didn't make it first time round. I, can I assume that the five who then were reinstated were top of that list in the, in the, in the scoring cri uh, criteria or point system or whatever it is? There was more than one scoring system because the, score, the scoring system is done on the basis of Sentence. absolute scores. There's also a judgment factor but the board had also asked to look at EDI and youth considerations as well and the additional one, which had been subject to a large discussion. Three of those five had come out at the top of the overall scoring system and, and, and um, the other two had come out highly in the EDI and, and, and youth section. So um, that was where they came to the end of a discuss decision on the five extra organisations. Okay. okay, thank you. Successful organisations scored as highly as the five whose decisions were reversed? Well, the, the three of them, no one scored as highly. Um, um, uh, th there's a difference between those organisations that apply that are potentially um, uh, fundable and those that are not. There are many more organisations that are fundable that we can't meet. And I think, as Janet said earlier, that uh, um, um, we would like to do more. We just have limited funds. So at the end, you have to take a degree of judgment and say these are the ones that we think are going to be the most effective about delivering art and culture in Scotland. Okay. Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Um, just want to go back to the issue of the geographic spread uh, of the funds. Uh, with the first round between 2015 and 18, there were 21 local authorities. In the current round, there's 21 local authorities. And Janet Archer a few moments ago mentioned that eight uh, of uh, the 11 uh, didn't put in any applications. Now, bearing in mind after the, the first round, the, the Boner uh, Keenly side had indicated uh, some concerns about the issue of the geographic spread. So what actions had Creative Scotland undertaken to ensure or to try to ensure that uh, there was going to be a wider geographic spread uh, between that first, uh, the first round and also this second round? So as I re uh, reported to the committee, uh, uh, as I've reported to the committee previously, we've appointed a new head of the place, uh, Gary Cameron, who is um, working very closely with local authorities. Um, he is at the moment looking at developing a, a really clear approach to how we might reach out in a better way. Um, so where um, 
we're obviously keen to get into community and into into local areas at a community planning level um, we don't have the staff resource to be able to do that across 32 local authorities so we're looking at clusters of, 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 of local authorities uh, and working with networks uh, who represent different um, geographic parts of Scotland um, so that process has begun um, we, we we've got um, well, as, we've, as we see here, we think we've got about nine parts of Scotland where we're really not featuring as strongly as we should. We can't tackle that uh, all immediately. Um, so what I think we'll do, um, not yet defined uh, wholly, is to focus on three um, a year over the, the next period. Um, so um, obviously, um, as Ayrshire's, the Ayrshire's is, 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 will be one of our first priorities. Um, so that's the approach that we'll be taking um, because we need to um, uh, work closely with people on the ground to look at what, 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 what might be able to be brought through initially perhaps in terms of project funding and then into RFO or whatever form of funding we have available to people in the future. Um, we are the board made a commitment um, alongside touring to equalities um, and diversity and inclusion um, and also to um, uh, business services which is another um, another area that we want to um, make sure that we we cover so that we can support organizations to become more resilient to look at new models uh, to be able to access more funding beyond creative scotland's funding which is only a, about a quarter of the overall turnover of the organizations that we support um, so we'll be doing that work on the ground um, allocating staff resource to be able to um, have those important conversations with people um, and encourage more applications to come through from from people who at the moment feel that Creative Scotland is a is a, is, is a barrier that they can't get through uh, and don't see themselves in the, the different funding funding streams that we offer so um, we are director of, of strategy has produced a, a, a think piece which we're, we're looking at internally in terms of how we can open the door more widely um, to people from, from different parts of Scotland. At the end of the day, we're challenged by the fact that the budget is finite um, and it's, it's, we, 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 we distribute a lot of money, um, but at the end of the day, we always have to make choices um, and on a daily basis, we're making choices with peers. Um, our panels are involving sector peers and Creative Scotland staff uh, and we're, we're only able to fund one in three of the applications that we receive um, and that's the nature of the organisation that we are. You mentioned there uh, regarding the, the nine areas that uh, you do some further work in. Um, have you already had that discussion at board level uh, to, uh, to look at your strategy going forward? Because you just mentioned there as well that I probably do three and then three and three. So what would the scoring be to actually pick the first three and then the second three and then the third three? Uh, we haven't had that discussion at board level um, although we have um, reported on our place partnerships um, which are currently in place in terms of in, in, in relation to different parts of Scotland as I've mentioned in, in, in South Ayrshire uh, being one of them um, we will bring that that, that discussion um, into um, into play at the uh, 29th of March board meeting which is the board meeting that will set the targeted funding for the strategic work that we're going to be doing over over the next period um, we elected not to take the whole budget to the board in um, January because it felt as if we had enough to do at that point ordinarily we would set our final budget once we get confirmation for the final budget from the Scottish Government and that's what we're doing again this year so the board are meeting again on the 29th of March it will look at um, its allocation of budgets uh, across everything else that we do out with RFO and um, make decisions at that stage in terms of how we move forward. Yeah. Sorry, Stuart, if I just could come in with a quick supplementary there. You're suggesting there, Miss Archer, that you know it's just something that you're now addressing. But as Mr McMillan said, the Boner Keenly side report was 2014 and you've been aware of this geographical distribution problem for the entire time that you've been in office. Indeed, uh, it was a huge row before you came into office. So it will sound to people in areas of Scotland that aren't being funded that, you know, like this is far too little too late. You should have been doing this a long time ago. Um, we, forgive me if I've not been clear, we do work geographically in many different different ways. Um, so this is a new initiative to, 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 to 
accelerate how we work in terms of places, but we have place partnerships which are accounted for on our website uh, with a, a, a large number of local authorities um, where we co-invest against match funding from local, local authorities, so uh, making our resource go further, um, and that's a bottom-up approach. We work with communities uh, to help develop their aspirations in terms of what they want to do in the arts. Uh, we've got um, a number of delegated funds, which are also listed on our website. Uh, so, for so example, for the visual arts, which have been distributed recently, um, again, um, much more work than RFO um, is... is, is, is um, is led by the organisation in, in, in different parts of Scotland. Uh, open project funding um, is, is also distributed uh, across Scotland, and we, we make announcements about that uh, on a weekly basis. So we, sorry, we distribute we, money on a weekly basis, and we make announcements on a regular basis. Sorry, had you finished? Okay. Mr. Uh, just one yeah. more. Um, um, certainly, notwithstanding certainly what uh, what you've just uh, said, uh, Miss Archer, uh, I'm just I jotted down just some of the local authorities. Uh, that, uh, that haven't been successful, uh, and uh, I, I, I would find it difficult to understand why Creative Scotland wouldn't have attempted to actually do some work in some of these local authority areas, because I'm quite sure there will have been, uh, with maybe a bit of, a bit of assistance uh, or a bit <coughs> of encouragement, that, uh, that bids would have came in from these areas, I mean, whether it's North Ayrshire or Western Bartonshire, I mean, Inverclyde, my own area, I mean, there's only been one uh, which were well, one successful application, which I am delighted about, but I know of others, organisations locally, that certainly could have uh, and possibly did put in applications uh, because there is a, a wealth of creative talent within the Inverclyde area. Obviously, our regularly funded programme is only one of the routes to funding, um, but all all of our funding application all of our funding programs are, are application based so we can only fund against the applications that we receive um, we are working we're accelerating the way that we work in local areas um, and we will do our very best to reach out to as many people as possible um, one of the other things that we're thinking about is can we make it easier for people to apply for open project funding um, which requires a form, um, not a business plan, but uh, still so. It's not straightforward for everyone. So are there easier ways that we could um, open up for folk to make an application to us? Uh, we're looking at that very hard at the moment. Withstanding your apology to the sector today, um, Janet, um, but I think there's still going to be a lot of frustration um, and anger out there, and it just shows by the um, level of correspondence that the committee have received. Um, do you think that there is a clear strategy that people actually within the industry know what you are looking for? Because um, it seems as though confidence has been shaken, people are not clear of why you have made decisions. Um, you made decisions after people, after the sector had gone through all five stages of the funding um, application process, and then there was this U-turn that appeared to have been a knee-jerk reaction, which has clearly um, shaken the confidence of, of um, people in the sector. Um, I just wondered, you, you talked about that you're going to learn from this moment. Um, there was also a uh, mention there about um, external review panels and outside consultants. Who are they? Um, you know, it, do you think that your assessment criteria at board level is robust? What is it um, that you're going to do to restore the confidence of this sector? I'm really talking to a number of people, um, both individuals and organisations, uh, also representative organisations of the different sectors that we support. My personal instinct is to get out and talk to people as proactively as possible to understand concerns to work with sectors to co-design the way that we fund in the future um, and share some of the difficult challenges that we have as an organization in distributing funding it's not an easy straightforward process when we know that we've got more applications that we could fund than we're able to that's not unusual for organizations like us um, I completely accept that we need to, to um, be clearer and maybe more focused in relation to how we deploy strategy. We did begin a process of doing that with the board in October, uh, and we all 
agreed that we need to be more focused in the future in terms of how we work. Ben led that process. The board uh, made a decision to wait until the new chair is in place. Um, he started last week, um, and we're now um, in, 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 in um, the process of, of, of looking at how we uh, reset, how we do things. We said last year, uh, before we made decisions on RFO, um, that we would go through a process of strategy review, funding review, um, and that had to happen in the middle part of our 10-year plan. We always knew that that was going to be the case. Um, we've had this period of stasis um, where, in, in following Richard passing away, um, we, the board made a decision to wait until a permanent chair was in place before we moved on with that, uh, but we're absolutely committed to, 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 to doing that now. I would say that we, you know, in terms of, of strategies, the organisation, um, when I joined the organisation, had carried out some really clear work in terms of art form needs, so there were individual um, sector reviews for each of the sectors, including touring. Um, so the Turing review was, was, was produced, written by Christine Hamilton. Um, in that, it says that, that Turing is the single most important issue for the theatre sector. So we picked up on that when we produced the art strategy. It's referenced that we'll do a piece. Of, we produced our art strategy in 2016. It's really clear that we wanted to support excellence, but we also wanted to support access. We wanted to support organisations to build resilience because we knew that there might be challenges ahead in terms of public funding. And we said in that that we'd do a piece of work around theatre touring. We commissioned that piece of work around theatre touring, um, which took place through much conversation with the sector. It was running in parallel with the, um, with the point at which we opened up for applications for regular funding. Um, so we have been working hand in hand with many people to be able to um, respond to um, clear issues that actually exist in terms of the arts. So the touring issue is a significant one. The number of dates that touring companies have reported um, as, as being able to access now has, has dropped from, I think, something like 23 to 13. Um, that creates huge pressures on companies if they're not able to generate the income that they once were able to. Um, and we need to do something focused, focused and, and, and concerted uh, around that to help companies work with venues to build audiences uh, in order to continue to sustain access to the highest quality art for folk across Scotland. So that that has been an ongoing piece of work for, for a very long time. And um, and I think it's right that we, we, we focus and continue to work on that with with the theatres and, and performing arts sectors. Um, well, when I came in as, as chairman um, um, in, in August, I recognise that the system was very complicated and, and that we needed to empower more the people who are actually speaking to the organisations and to the sectors to, um, to be able to do things different with a clearer set of um, priorities and items because um, they, they were working on sort of six columns, 15 pillars, four interlocking themes and it became quite complicated as to actually how you prioritise that and move to a much simpler base where the ultimate justifications were around the benefits that each decision made on cultural, social, and economic grounds. And that would be across the organization. Um, we had a whole day discussing it in, in October with, with backing up papers. The board decided that given that we we're in the middle of the RFA process and that strategy had already been set for RFA, and given that I was only the interim chair, they decided that they would um, uh, um, move that until uh, 2018, when a permanent chair was in place, and uh, and that uh, um, and that the RFO process had been completed. I would say, though, in, in defence, uh, the the. Um ambitions and priorities that sit in the 10-year plan were worked through in consultation with many people and when we published the plan we went out on the road we had workshops in different parts of Scotland and talked to over a thousand people we had a sector reference group of 28 people I think um, from different parts of the arts sectors who contributed to that journey um, with all of that involvement we thought we did quite well to get it down to five ambitions um, and, and, and 15 priorities but um, I think all of us realise that, that that does need to focus in the future. Well, I mean, that doesn't reflect in the, um, the correspondence that we have been getting um, because people refer to your new approach. Um, 
I think the sector believed that they were reaching um, the strategic requirements uh, to qualify for the funding. Um, but that just hasn't um, been communicated through. And you might have had a thousand um, engagements with people in the sector, but maybe those were the people uh, that uh, were actually applying for the funding, but just didn't get what you were trying to communicate. And I think that's where the breakdown has, has been here. And it's not just the time frame that's been the issue. It's been the actual communication from Creative Scotland, where the sector has believed that they're meeting the strategic objectives. They have applied for the funding. They've got through the five um, processes within the application. They've thought that they're going to have sustainable funding, and it has not happened. Um, and those six organisations, there's been a knee-jerk reaction to that. And I just think, um, you know, there can be excuses for in terms of the timings, but uh, this is um, a fundamental um, fault within Creative Scotland in terms of the whole process within the um, assessment criteria at board level, perhaps. Um, who are your outside consultants? Um, and I think you need to commit to making clear um, how your decisions are made and in particular using this as an example the Gaiety Theatre they thought they were meeting the strategic decisions because um, there was an absence of you know the published theatre strategy how can they actually meet those strategic decisions when there is an absence of a theatre strategy to answer a specific question our, our external accessors and panel members are on our website um, and uh, for, open for open project funding, so you can see the sorts of people that we bring in to um, to give advice. And you know, on theatre, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that we we use. But in each of the different art forms, we bring in um, uh, outside people to to give us additional colour and depth into the decisions that are being made by the executives. For the open project funding, but yes. for the RLFO, you don't have any external assessors, do you? No, we didn't no. decide. Right. We, 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 this time we elected not to do that on the basis of... And that's that been a big criticism of this process. We did, we did an initial scan to see whether that might be possible, but because so many people are involved in the RFA process, it became quite hard to find people who could contribute. Um, Mary Gujon. Oh, thank you. It was really just to come directly on the back of Rachel Hamilton's question. She covered a lot of the points that I was looking to raise because, again, I was going to touch on the correspondence and the sheer level of correspondence that we received, which did have a lot of it had common threads uh, running right through them about the lack of consistency in decision making, lack of transparency, uh, lack of communication. You've had two board, uh, two year board members resign. And as Tavish Scott and Claire Baker have already said, it just seems that those who shout the loudest uh, can get their funding decisions reversed. So, as has already been touched on, there are clearly fundamental problems right through the process. Um, and obviously, there has to be a review of the situation and to look at where you go from here, because uh, the process in getting here clearly hasn't worked. Um, and it was just really about that, that review process, uh, because I do think that there has to be an independent element to that, looking at what happened and what went wrong and really where we go with that. Um, and I'd also like to know uh, what engagement you've had since those decisions were taken with unsuccessful applicants and how you support those organisations who've been unsuccessful from here on in. And do you work with them to try and help them identify other sources of funding? And how does that relationship go and has that work already started? On the second point, um, we are meeting with organisations daily at the moment. Uh, some of those meetings are lasting up to five hours. Um, we're talking through um, the decision that we made. Uh, we're looking at options in relation to alternative sources of funding. Um, and so those meetings are underway. Uh, we've made a commitment to have more than one meeting in the instance where that's the right thing to do. Some people prefer to have a shorter meeting um, and then meet again. Um, in terms of reviewing, we absolutely need to review this process. Um, we need to, uh, w w when we review things, we're used to doing them in, in, in three ways. So um, internally reviewing, um, and all of our staff are very keen to be part of that. Um, and we'll, we'll, we've begun the process of, of considering how that might be framed, um, and, and, and we will undertake that uh, as an internal exercise. We need to also engage with peers uh, and with the sector, 
uh, and we've begun the process of talking to sector organisations and um, we'll work out how we manage that process um, and we need to also bring in some independent thinking to get to, to give us advice which is a process that we do do in 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 in, in other instances uh in order to be able to frame how we move forwards overall we're always going to have to make difficult decisions um because there's never going to be unless unless um something changes there's never going to be enough money uh, to fund everybody through through regular funding um, so we also know um, that 50% um, of the applications that we got asked for more than 50% of um, their total turnover from this process. Um, and we need to think hard in terms of what the right thing to do is in terms of what level of, of contribution regular funding might make to an organisation uh, and how that's married up in terms of other income streams. Um, different organisations have, diff have, 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 have different levels of experience or uh, challenges in relation to accessing other forms of funding. And I think all of that needs to be become part of the conversation in thinking about how we frame um, funding and, 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 and deliver it in the future. Um, but there will always be the need to, to make decisions. Um, I think we need to get to a clearer, more focused set of um, policy, um, agreed policy, uh, so that everybody, everybody agrees what, 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 what we're endeavouring to achieve through all of our routes to funding, um, so that we don't get into this situation again. In terms of working with people through the application process, though, is that something that you actively do when people are preparing applications uh, to put forward? Do you actively work with them uh, to help them through that process? We provide advice through our inquiries service um, and through officers. Um, we don't have the staff resource to be able to provide um, hand one-to-one -one support for everybody making an application um, simply because we get a higher volume of applications than we have staff um, and other, you, you may have noticed that other funding agencies uh, are, are starting to pull back even from inquiry services so um, we, we do what we can um, but I would it would be wrong of me to, to, to suggest that we can um, offer every applicant detailed advice uh, with the resource that we've got available at the moment. But I'm presuming that all of this would be included as part of the review that you're doing. And just to clarify exactly. as well, there will be an independent element to that yeah. review. And I think there are things that we could do better um, in terms of how we provide advice. So we could we could do something online, for example, um, where we, 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 we give a, a more human uh, account of, of the steps one needs to take in terms of um, making an application with guidance uh, that isn't just writ the written word, um, but... But, but, but maybe through other means of media as, as, as well. Um, but I think all of those things can be thought about. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If Sean asked you to clarify if there would be an independent element in the review, can you just say yes or no if there will be? With, we haven't made a commitment to how we're going to frame the review yet because we're having internal discussions with that. We'll discuss that with our board. We're discussing that with sector organisations. Um, we are well used to working with independent um, uh, uh, consultants on, 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 on um, different aspects of work. Um, we just need to consider that uh, in the context of what everybody wants us to do before we make a final decision. Um, and obviously there would be a cost element to that and we'd need to take that into consideration. I would have thought in a you know, situation like this, um, the expectation would be that there would be an independent review. Oh, so uh, can I just add one yeah. bit of clarification there as well? Because when you talk about independent consult consultants, mm -hmm advising on the review that's different to people independently doing a review so which of the two is it and will you be looking at independent in your review independently being carried out we haven't made a final decision yet uh, and i'm um i can honestly say that this this discussion has not yet been had with our new chair um I will, of course, be discussing that with him. And as I say, I'm very used to working with independent re um, reviewers um, for pieces of work um, that, that, that an organisation does. Um, I just um, wouldn't commit to that at this stage um, until I've had that conversation with, with, with our new chair. Um, what I, com I completely agree with the convener. Uh, we need to have an honest root and branch look uh, at how this process has worked in order to um, 
gen create a, a, a platform for future thinking in terms of, 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 of where we move to. Um, so I'm not um, afraid of that. Many people will be surprised that you haven't put that in place already since you've already announced the review, but I'll move on to Richard Lockhead. Respond to that. Yes. Um, we are still in the middle of the process of meeting with organisations. Um, so, as I said, uh, as I've already um, given testimony to, we don't yet know uh, the full extent of um, concerns from organisations that we're talking to. Um, so we've, we've, we, uh, we want to complete that process and then, and then make a decision in relation to where we go next. Right. Richard Lockhead. Thank you. <coughs> Firstly, thank you for the um, award for Body Surf Scotland and Murray. So it does show that there's some progress in uh, addressing geographical spread uh, along last. So thank you for that. That'll be uh, most welcome. In terms of the decision-making process, I very much recognise the severe difficulties uh, with funding rounds and how painful they are, because once a group asks for three-year funding and they get it, they want another three years after that, and another three years after that, and it squeezes out room for innovation and new applicants, and I absolutely get that. So that's why it's really important the decision process is transparent and credible. And what I really want to get to the heart of is, why did you not anticipate the backlash from the arts community, especially in relation to the rejection of the applications from the groups working with performers with disabilities and other groups working with children. Um, and some of these groups were getting a lot of praise over the years and appeared to be very effective. You must have anticipated that backlash. Now, on the one hand, you may say that, oh, they didn't score high enough in the assessment process. But then you have, of course, revisited some of those decisions since. So you do seem to agree that they are effective organisations and should get support. So why did you not anticipate that backlash? We did report risks to the board um, at the, the meeting that took place in, in, in January. Obviously, there will always be risks when you've got more applications that you can fund than you're able to fund because of a budget. Um, so whether these whether it was these risks or whether it was other risks, um, we, we would always have um, some disappointed applicants. Uh, and if you remember in, in um, 1518, we also too had disappointed applicants um, at that point. Why did you take decisions to reject applications in the first place? On the basis of the uh, proposition that there was an opportunity to fund touring companies in a better way uh, in the future, um, than, than, than through regular funding. Do you think you're, well, would you agree that your decision-making process has um, had its credibility severely damaged? Yeah. You do agree? And, and I, as I say, I'm profoundly sorry about that and completely committed to reviewing and understanding the detail of how that's come to be and making decisions quickly and with the sector in collaboration with people in, in moving forwards. Yeah. One impression I've got from the evidence the committee's uh, received is that <clears throat> the applications, if I remember correctly, in around nine months before the actual decision on average, and then an email arrived notifying the applicants after nine months that uh, they were unsuccessful. Is that the case, or was there constant communication between over the nine months, giving updates, explaining how to improve their applications or giving feedback on the likelihood of what the outcome might be uh, and so on and so forth? We, we made regular communication and statements in, 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 in relation to um, how we were um, considering budget outcomes. So they came through Ian Munro, uh, who led the funding process, um, and we communicated to organisations um, consistently. Um, to be honest, we were anticipating much worse, a much um, harder situation uh, in relation to budget cuts. So we were not only having to scenario plan against potential Scottish Government budget cuts, we were also scenario planning against the uh, huge reduction uh, last year in terms of minus 15% for National Lottery funding. Um, so we had two 
um, serious issues um, pointing at us from, 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 from two directions. So we were very careful um, about communicating that um, on a consistent basis to organisations over the course of that period. Um, despite that, the applications that we received, um, I think I'm right in saying that the um, applications that we received from existing organisations um, were about 24% more than current levels of funding. So um, I think that's indicative of, of, of funding needs um, or, or, or individual um, perceived needs in terms of organisations. And, 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 and the, we've had feedback. Um, we know that organisations have been operating on standstill for um, a good decade or more um, and, and consequently will always um, apply for additional funding uh, in order to generate um, um, opportunities for artists to work and for audiences and, and participants to be able to access the arts. Uh, there's a lot of ambition in Scotland uh, and, and, and that's to be credited. Um, so, um, yeah. I think and finally, one of the big themes is the perceived disconnect between Creative Scotland and the arts community. That's uh, shown through much of the evidence we've received and the, the commentary and the media and so on and so forth. And when Ben Thompson outlined the decision-making criteria, I have to say I didn't really understand. It sounds very complicated. So how on earth applicants are supposed to interpret that for when they're putting together their applications um, it escapes me. Uh, what's your response to the view amongst many people there is a disconnect between Creative Scotland that's very bureaucratic. Front page of the Herald today is talking about £150,000 on 38 consultants and so on. Uh, what's your view on that perceived disconnect? Page of the Herald is talking about um, the cost of employing um, peer sector experts to help contribute to our decision making. Um, and obviously we do pay people if we ask them to help us with making decisions. Um, in, 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 sorry, could you just go back to your question? What's your response to the perceived disconnect between Creative Scotland yeah, so, and the arts community? So we, I have always personally, um, and my teams have always um, had much debate and discussion uh, on all of the pieces of the work that we've done around sector reviews, around strategies um, and, and, and funding. I think what happened, if I'm really honest, um, is that when, and I, and I attended a meeting of, of um, an FST uh, meeting just before Christmas, uh, over that period when we were looking at those very, very difficult scenarios, um, we, uh, we, um, we didn't engage as closely with organisations to tell them that that's what we were doing. Um, I think that was quite a challenging um, prospect for staff um, because had we had we communicated um, last October, November, that we were potentially facing um, cutting the regularly funded uh, network by half, um, that would have created an, 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 another set of anxieties. So my focus and Ben's focus at the time was on making the case. So we, we, we produced a, a case for investment, creative culture and creativity matters. We published data on our website. We met many um, MSPs and ministers um, and we proactively made the case for arts funding um, and worked very closely with the Cabinet Secretary who was successful in generating an extra 6.6 .6 million into the arts. Um, it felt absolutely vital that that's the work that we should be doing at that time, um, as opposed to um, putting a message out that we were in a position where, 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 where um, we were potentially going to have to reduce the network by half. Can I just ask one more question? Can you know, just one okay. thing? Very quickly, because we're going to have to... Left a little bit from an outside perspective, having coming into the organisation. Um, it is very difficult being a funding organisation, particularly to the arts, because... Um, uh, um, there is an element if you've had funding for the last three years of entitlement to funding going forward because you've come to rely on it. So the decisions that you make to try and balance bringing in the, uh, the, uh, the 19 new organisations compared to the 15 that went out is always going to cause um, a level of, of um, disquiet and difficulty. And because that's done an RFO once every three years, it does create a tension once every three years where this is a really big event for people, and therefore there is quite uh, uh, a lot of um, debate, anxiety, and stress. Certainly wasn't helped by the chair dying at the start, uh, halfway through this process, and that caused a considerable amount of, of stress in the organization. Um, interesting to note that none of the other board directors 
were either willing or capable to um, stand up to the position of being chair, probably because they recognise that this is a very difficult process to get through. But I don't think any of that should underestimate that the successes that Creative Scotland has had over the last three years since the last part of regular funding, I think no one will disagree that culture and arts in Scotland has actually been doing well. And, and that's down to the organisations themselves, but it actually is also down to the organisations that support, uh, like Creative Scotland, art and culture in Scotland. And, um, and you know, in this period, with the help of, uh, uh, well, with, with Scottish Government really helping the support in terms of the case, we've addressed the difficulty of lottery funding um, for the time being, which is a major achievement for the sector as a whole. Um, so I think um, uh, I could totally understand why people are upset, frustrated, angry, and I'm sorry for that. This process does create that effect once every three years. But I think it shouldn't take away from the fact that this is actually a very credible organisation and that art and culture in Scotland is actually doing very well. We've supported 121 organisations more than ever before um, uh, um, going forward. And I can see that um, art and culture in Scotland will continue to flourish um, going forward over the next three years. So I don't, I don't think we should... You know, the, the noise that has happened over the last month, particularly in the press, about... Uh, um, uh, words like fiasco and, and disconnect and all the rest, I totally understand and appreciate. But actually, looking long term, I think there's a huge amount of added value that this organisation has created for um, the sector. And the sector is doing very well, which is a credit to everyone who's involved with it. I'll just leave it there. Um, thank you very much. Um, we, we have gone over time, uh, but I think we owe it to the sector, given the amount of uh, correspondence we've had from the sector. It's quite unprecedented, and the number of concerns that have been raised. Uh, if, I think it's right that we've gone over time and we get the chance to explore these issues. I've just got some members who want to ask supplementary questions, so if we can just go on for another 10 minutes, if that's OK. Um, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, Creative Scotland was established as an independent decision-making body, and we've went into detail about how decisions were made. Um, what impact did the Cabinet Secretary's tweeting on the subject have, and did you have a discussion with the Cabinet Secretary prior to the meeting on the 2nd of February? No impact, and no. We didn't discuss that with the Cabinet Secretary. Right, no discussion at all. So decision... I mean, it's recognised that there was increased pressure on the organisation in those two weeks coming from... Um, politicians as well as from the organisations. And it's got regular funding with the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so I um, uh, attended an event with the Cabinet Secretary um, in, as part of our Gaelic showcase at Celtic Connections, and we didn't discuss regular funding. Um, Thank you. Another today. question was around... Um, we, are to we do recognise that there's a limited budget that Creative Scotland have to spend. Um, there has been comments made about the proportion increase that has gone to second tier support organisations. Um, can you see why there is uh, questions around that and why, how do you justify that and what do you think the benefits to provide more support to these organisations are? I take responsibility. I think we didn't communicate that well. Um, previously, we had supported those some of those organisations, not all of them. Um, they, some of them changed. Um, previously, we had a separate budget um, alongside regular funding, which um, supported sector development. Um, and this time round, we brought them into play with regular funding to simplify things. Um, overall, um, some organisations came out and some organisations came in. Um, the new one is um, Creative, uh, Dundee, Creative Edinburgh, um, Scottish Music Industry Association, um, all provide for... Um, organisations and companies and individuals uh, who exist beyond regular funding. So regular funding can only support 121 organisations. Uh, Scotland's creative sectors are much, much bigger. Uh, and we wanted to provide support uh, for, 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 for those organisations in terms of looking at innovation, new models, sustainability, um, as well as providing advice and guidance um, and insight into, into, into how to work in individual sectors. Uh, it feels really important to do that. Uh, at the moment, when pressures on, 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 on public 
budgets are getting tougher. Um, we need to find ways of working to generate um, sustainable models, as, 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 as this committee is, is, is named, uh, in, a, in, 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 a, in a really um, appropriate way in, in the future. Um, and I think there are um, things that we can offer um, through working with sector development organisations that can help with that and, 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 and indeed some of those organisations, arts and business for example, um, do some tremendous work in stimulating private investment into, into the arts. Thank you. Um, Ross Green. Just a, a couple of points of clarification on the Touring Theatre Fund. When was the decision made to create that fund? The Touring Theatre Fund was, um, was uh, proposed as part of the Turing um, Theatre and Dance Review, which was published in April 16. I'll check that. Um, April 17. April, April 17. 17. April, April 17. 17. Um, so that's when the Turing Fund uh, was, was first um, published um, as, a, as a proposition. Um, and the definition around the budget uh, of how much money would be needed for it was based on... A, um, counting up how much um, investment we spend through in a more ad hoc way through open project funding which is about 1.7 million um, a year um, and we, we the, the strong advice that we've we've had through the consultation that we've we've we've, we've been um, undergoing um, is that it, it would be much better to have a focused touring fund um, than agreed though I get proposed in April 17 when was it agreed it's that that not, fund would be it's created? not been agreed by the board yet yeah. so right so as a budget so organizations been, have been moved out of uh, who submitted applications for regular funding and met the criteria at the time they submitted then became ineligible for regular funding because they would become eligible for a fund that has not been created, doesn't have any detail behind it. The, the final guidance, I'm talking about the detail of the guidance which we committed to co-designing with the theatre sector has not been finally signed off uh, yet. The, the provision the, for the budget and, and uh, the provision for the um, uh, strategic spend um, is, 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 is in, is, has been discussed by the board. Right. Um, uh, my original question still hasn't been answered. It was proposed in April 17. The final details have not been agreed. When was it agreed that this fund would be created? That's a separate decision to it being proposed and to the final details of it being worked out. We were predicting a very difficult budget scenario in, in, in planning for budgets. We found out about our draft budget on 14th of December, along with other public bodies. Um, it was only at that point that we knew we'd be, we'd be in a position to be able to respond to the recommendations that were coming out of the, the, the touring review and begin to plan to, uh, to budget um, for, for, for such a fund. So uh, we weren't in a position until we got our, our draft budget from the Scottish Government uh, to be able to consider whether that was an option or not, um, because prior to that we were we were we were modelling um, very difficult scenarios against um, potentially minus 15 or minus 30 percent uh, funding overall. The review that, that you mentioned that this proposal has came out of was very clear that touring theatre required longer term funding. So would it be correct to assume that this fund, being an annual fund, is an option that's been ruled out, because that would run counter to the recommendation that this proposal was based on. Uh, sorry, I don't understand your question. The, um, if this fund, so regular funding is three yearly. The proposed touring fund, um, there is some concern within the sector that it would be annual funding. We haven't defined that yet. It could be a longer term fund. Um, it but hasn't been... A report which was very, very clear in its recommendation that the reason that we needed to do something different with touring theatre was that it needed longer term funding. Yes. So surely... That's the discussion that's taking place now. So it's possible, uh, and it will be very much dependent on what the sector wants us to do, that that could um, effectively account for the remainder of the two-year period um, for RFO. So we're entering into a three-year period. The, the, the remaining three touring companies um, that we haven't funded in RFO um, uh, are... Um, or at least current touring companies, there are many, many more besides... Um, are funded for 12 months. Uh, it's possible that the Turing Fund will then play out over the following two years if that's what the sector wants us to do. And the, 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 I, I would imagine that's highly likely uh, because it's a strategic programme um, and it will need to be um, designed 
uh, and delivered over a period of time for it to really work, because it will be entirely dependent on... Just for far longer, just one final point of clarification. What is the timescale on which the details of this fund will be agreed? By, by which point will we as a committee, will the sector know exactly how this fund will function? My original commitment um, was that we would um, publish the guidance for that fund on June the 1st. I've had some feedback from, from the sector that that might be a bit premature. So I think we need to work with the sector. We've got two working groups uh, which are chaired by um, mem members of FST. Um, we've met with them. Um, we need to work with them and determine a practical time timeline in relation to when that fund will be open. Um, but we are absolutely committed to ensuring that the first grants are in place so delivery can happen from April 1st, 2019. Um, we just need to work out the practicalities of making sure that the co-design of that fund gives enough space for uh, people to be able to have voice and be involved. Thank you. John Scott, do you, you want to come back in? Yes, please, convener. Thank you. So if you can help me, as things stand, if I've understood this correctly, you took a system that was working um, for assessing bids for RFO. It was complicated, 15 pillars, 6 columns, or maybe it was the other way around. But nonetheless, it was understood by the internal evaluators. You started again and changed it completely and didn't communicate this, and it wasn't defined. And, and you now apologise for the chaos. Uh, so, air gaiety is collateral damage, in my view, in all of that. And further, according to Mr Thompson, uh, it appears that you introduced a further new criteria, which was clamour and noise. And if you made a sufficient amount of noise and clamour, then your bid would have been reassessed. I'm left with the feeling that I have somehow failed my community in Ayrshire because I and others didn't make enough noise and therefore you didn't reconsider the air gaiety bid. So I would ask you, if I may, in terms of the viability of air gaiety and others, how are you going to retrieve that situation where organisations, as Burns would have said, from no good or ill they've done it for them, have now been found into a position where their viability is threatened by your actions that were organisations that were previously viable? Airgate is funded until September. Uh, we've already met with the theatre in relation to advice on other options in relation to funding. We're meeting with the theatre and the local authority very soon, um, next week, I think, um, but I'll check that um, in order to progress that conversation. Um, and we will continue to work to advise uh, over over coming months. Um, we fully understand how challenging and hard it is for organisations who've applied for funding and not received it, but all of our applications are based on the quality of the, 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 the application that we received. Um, and, 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 and obviously that had to be taken into account in respect to the 184 applications that we got um, across the whole of Scotland, um, and we didn't have the budget to be able to fund all of them. So in terms of the your question on strategy, the, st the strategy review was that an understanding that the strategy could be a lot simpler and clearer, and that to introduce um, a strategy not for the process of the RFO as it was happening now, but for the RFO going forward, because the RFO is under a current process, which had already been set out, so people had to meet the requirements under it. But it was a recognition that actually going forward, the RFO um, uh, um, is complicated for people, does put people off in terms of the process and what they have to meet, and therefore, going forward, we should have a strategy that changes that, and we should start work on that as soon as possible. I mean, I should say that we have had positive communication from, 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 from some folk in relation, even, even in the instance where um, we've made a difficult decision and not funded to the level that applicants have been uh, uh, have applied for. I have had some communication from people that they understand how we've made the decisions that we've made. Um, and even just this week, we've, we've had a communication from uh, one venue affected, um, which has reviewed its application and its assessment and said, we absolutely understand the um, the process and it, it, it makes sense um, and, and, and we're not going to challenge your decision. So that's why I want to uh, get through the totality of the meetings that we're having to really understand the scale of the, 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 the issue that we're dealing with here um, in order to be able to properly report to the committee uh, once we've done that. 
Um, we clearly understand that there's an issue in, in, in South Ayrshire, um, and, and there are, are some other issues too in relation to um, applications that have been made uh, where, they, where they haven't been funded. But I, I do want to understand the full extent of that um, before properly commenting in relation to um, what we're, we're dealing with. Can I just ask you to, to go back to the um, how, how you're going to the, the reversal of some of your decisions? You still you've explained how you're going to to fund it up to a point, but you've also said that some of the money is going to come from targeted funds. Can you give us a reassurance that the place partnership will not be among those targeted funds? Yeah. So yeah. we can we will continue to work um, in, in in relation to place, um, and as I um, accounted to to. Um, Stuart McMillan, I, 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 we have a plan in place in terms of how we might um, extend the work we, 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 we do geographically. But I also think we have to have an honest conversation around um, how overall we look at the totality of, 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 of what we do across Scotland uh, and, and, and um, make difficult decisions in the future. Come out of the place partnership, you can give us an, a reassurance on that, can you? No shortfall out of the... Uh, in order to to fund the decisions you've reversed. You had said earlier that targeted funds, which include the place partnership, uh, would be used, and you ruled out some things like your youth music initiative is quite rightly protected. Uh, targeted, targeted funding for 18-19 remains at the same level for 17-18. Um, so we have the same budget available um, for, for, for targeted funding. Right. And also, Claire Baker uh, raised the issue that you're, you're spending 4.7 million on organisations which are not artist-led. Um, you, 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 you answered that. Many people will still find it inexplicable. But there is, apparently, you have a you review uh, for funding for individual artists that was supposed to be concluded in September 2017. Can you tell us what the what that review recommended? The, so that review um, was um, reported to our leadership team um, early this year. Um, what we're, what we're, we've got two options, I think, in terms of what we do. Uh, one is to make the application process uh, more straightforward and um, to um, simplify the um, questions that we ask organisations. We have an option of making it a two-stage process um, in order to, uh, for, for people not to need to um, uh, fill in the whole form um, before gauging whether or not the project that they're putting forward uh, fits within, within guidance. Um, I think we also have the option of looking at our open project funding budget, which at the moment is um, split between organisations and individual artists and creative, um, creative people. Um, the majority of open project funding at the moment is spent on organisations. Um, so uh, I haven't got the exact number in my head, but uh, it's something like a, 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 a 75, uh, 78 um, uh, um, uh, 22 split uh, percent in, 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 in terms of how the budget sits. Um, we can change that dial and allow for more funding within open project funding for artists and individuals. Um, and that's something that we're looking at very seriously. Um, what that will do, um, uh, and, and, and I can hear the organisations that benefit from open project funding wince. Uh, as I say that, is, is, is that means we would have less funding in, in, in open project funding for, for organisations. So there's, there's, a, there's a difficult decision to be made there. But we do have, you know, I would say we've got 121 regularly funded organisations. We've got um, a similar number, if not more, of hidden regularly funded organisations that come through open project funding. Uh, and that's a, that's a, that's a very brutal challenge that we we face as a funder um, but that's that those the, these are the mechanisms that we currently um, use to um, support um, Scotland's cultural sector um, there's always a balance of, 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 of decisions to be made in terms of, of, of how we focus that funding uh, but clearly it's important to provide for artists and artists led organizations it's it's in our strategy the organization that people rely on to do that uh, more than any more than any other and I think that's why so many people are upset you know such a large part of the government's uh, 4.6 million uplift has gone to organizations that I know they spend uh, a lot of time lobbying people like me for example they uh, they offer workshops and mentoring which is all very well but they don't support artists they don't they don't provide artists with a with a living wage that allows them to make art uh, and that's what will 
people will be really concerned about. I think the other thing that you've uh, raised today, um, which people will be very concerned about, is the change in the goalposts in terms of the um, the application process for these touring theatre companies. You changed the goalposts without telling them, and we've heard today that this that this touring fund hasn't even been signed off by your board. Uh, I think that will be of real concern to people, given it was such a key part of your strategy for withdrawing the funding from these organisations. Uh, there are many more areas that um, we, uh, wish, we wish to explore as a committee, uh, and a, a number of members have said that uh, we have uh, had a great deal of engagement from the sector. So after our evidence session today, I think we'll have a, a discussion about how best we can take some of those uh, concerns forward based on what you've told us today. But I'd like to thank you both for coming uh, to give your evidence and uh, for going over time today. Um, it's appreciated. Thank you very much. We'll now, we'll now suspend and move into private session.